Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Before we get started today, uh, a few things I just wanted to cover. Uh, first of all, um, a few of you may have noticed that I neglected to upload the PDF version uh, of today's lecture slides. So the PowerPoint is there, uh, but the PDF version, I just did not export the PowerPoint as a PDF and just forgot to do that yesterday. So my apologies, I will remember to do that. I'll try to remember to do that tonight. Uh, so that I can get it up there for you tonight if you need it. If you were counting on it to take notes today, I really apologize for that. It's just a, one of those many things that <laughs> uh, I just forgot to do yesterday. So uh, slides are up there in PowerPoint format, just not in PDF format. Uh, you could make your own PDF if you happen to have PowerPoint available on your device. That might be a possibility, uh, but I just didn't upload them uh, today. So I'll get to that uh, later tonight. Uh, number two, uh, the second thing I just wanted to mention, um, I can't find the remote. Like, so I'm going to have to, it's going to reduce the amount of pacing around that I'm going to be able to do, which is probably for the best. Uh, so I'll have to stand here in order to advance uh, the slides from one slide to the next. Any questions on anything before we get started? Oh, there was one third thing. Of course, today is quiz number three. Uh, you'll find it on OWL. Uh, available for you covering the last three lectures last week and today. Uh, it's on the OWL site starting as of 5 p.m. tonight, so sometime after today's lecture. Uh, it'll be available for 24 hours, same as quiz two. Uh, you have 30 minutes, there's 15 questions. Uh, it's in a linear format, uh, and the grades will be posted to your uh, OWL site uh, later today. Any questions on anything before we get started? All right, that's great. Let's. Um, I am recording this, so let me just go ahead and make the slides big. I'm uh, going to hide my floating meeting controls, which I would try to remember the keystroke commands to do that, but look at that. Control, Alt, Shift, H. That's a lot of work. Uh, so I'll just do it by hand each time. So remember last week, we talked about the psychology of language, and we talked about language and thinking. Uh, and one of the points we tried to make, one of the points I tried to make, was that it's really difficult to think of anything without using language, right? And I said, try to think of something, try to recall a memory or try to uh, um, think about something you've done or make a plan uh, or entertain any kind of thought without using language. It's really difficult. Uh, but today we're gonna sort of talk about the alternative, uh, thinking without language. In other words, thinking through visual images. Now that doesn't mean that no language is involved, but what I wanna talk about is that sometimes when you think about things, uh, you don't, need to necessarily use language to do it. Uh, and you may use language in conjunction with some sort of uh, mental imagery system that many of us, though not, though not, not everyone, uh, has complete access to. Uh, so a mental image, uh, think about it this way. So suppose we ask, uh, I'm asking the following questions. A mental image is a representation that preserves visual and spatial information. Now, again, this doesn't mean in complete uh, isolation or uh, completely separate from language, but it's a representation that preserves this visual spatial information in its analog format. And by analog, I mean that uh, in the same way that it might take you a certain amount of time to walk from one area, from one end of the classroom to the other, it's going to take a few seconds, right? Uh, it would similarly take a few seconds to look from one side to the other. And it would also take some time to imagine myself with my eyes closed, looking at one side of the room to the other. It's really difficult to immediately switch perspectives in the mind's eye from one side of the room to the other. That's what I mean by a representation that preserves visual spatial information in an analog format. You interact with that memory or you interact with that uh, representation in a way that is similar to how you would interact with the object in real physical three-dimensional space. So if I ask you what street you live on, you don't need to imagine it, right? You just come up with your address, right? You can come up with your street address uh, by retrieving a semantic memory. If I ask you what your email address is, you don't need to imagine your email, right? You don't need to create a mental image of your email. You just answer with a fact, right? You answer with your email address. But if I ask you, what color is the house next to the house you grew up in? So what color is the house next to yours? 
In order to answer that question, you probably have to imagine yourself, or one way to answer that question is to imagine yourself standing on the street in front of your house and then imagining what the house next to it looks like. How many of you can sort of do that? You can sort of stand in front of, you may not even get the right answer, right? You stand in front of the street and you imagine yourself looking at the street right next, at the house right next to it. You can't answer that specifically with a language-based fact. You have to answer that question by imagining something. Uh, or what icons are on the home screen of your phone? Without looking at it, you could probably imagine some of the things that are on the home screen of your phone, but maybe not everything. So maybe you don't have all of them, but you probably don't have a list of them. It's probably not a language-based list. It's not a lexical list. Uh, it's not a semantic memory that you've stored as a list of information. But if you want to try to answer, what are the icons, uh, what are the apps that are on the home screen of your phone? You probably imagine a picture of your phone uh, in your mind's eye and then try to scan through the picture of your phone to try to answer. Yes. Uh, well, it relies heavily on the visual spatial sketch pad. That's a great question. So if you didn't hear the question, how does this relate to visual spatial sketch pad? Uh, the visual spatial sketch pad would be the component of mo uh, working memory that would allow you to do uh, this kind of thing, uh, that would allow you to retrieve a representation that is image-based and then interact with it uh, in this image-based way. Now, I should say at the outset that not everyone uh, has a strong sense of visual or auditory imagery. A condition called antiphasia uh, is one in which people have the inability to create a mental image of this type. It doesn't mean that they can't interact with visual spatial information. Uh, it just means that they don't have the phenomenon of imagining or visualizing something uh, in their mind's eye. And the particular causes for antiphasia are not quite fully known. Uh, but it does seem to be something that is present uh, and is a real condition, uh, though still fairly rare. Most of us, uh, most people have this visual imagery system. So what I've said here is that some of these questions return a fact. And by return, I just mean that if you ask the question, you give back a fact, uh, a language-based fact. Other questions return an image. In other words, if you're asked the question, what you come back with is an image. And in order to answer the question, you need to inspect the image. So mental imagery is this processing of perceptual-like information in the absence of, exter of an external source for that perceptual information. We can all process perceptual information when something is in front of us. So if I ask you how far away from the computer screen are you sitting, uh, you can estimate how far away from your screen you're actually sitting, whether it's uh, you know, uh, 15 centimeters or 20 centimeters or 30 centimeters. You can kind of give an estimate, right? It's right in front of you. But if I ask you to close your eyes, and just imagine doing this, close your eyes uh, and imagine trying to estimate how far you are. You can picture uh, what's in front of you even with your eyes closed. And if you can picture what's in front of you with your eyes closed, you're using a mental image to answer the question. So let's talk first about, in this first slide, I just wanna talk briefly about some of the principles of mental imagery. Uh, then we'll talk about some of the characteristics of mental imagery. And then I wanna spend the rest of today's class talking about uh, evidence for and against mental imagery, mostly evidence in favor of the existence of this separate visual spatial uh, image-based store. Uh, and then also talk about how mental imagery affects other kinds of behaviors. So for the most part, uh, mental images tend to be implicitly encoded. We actually used this example quite a while ago when I talked about incidental exposure. And I suggested that you might not have a good sense of exactly what the objects on your screen's home, uh, your, the uh, objects on your phone's home screen uh, would be. You see it every day. Uh, you interact with your phone many times a day, but you probably haven't thought exactly what apps are on the front screen, have you? How many of you know exactly what apps are on the front screen of your phone? How many of you know exactly what apps are on the front screen of your phone because it's a very small number? <laughs> How many of you have a lot of apps on the front screen but also still know what that number is, right? Uh, it's not really very straightforward. Um, 
Same thing would be at the bottom of your computer, which uh, things are on the bottom bar, uh, whether it's a Windows or a uh, Apple computer. There's usually a place where those the, the most commonly occurring apps are being stored, right? And we suggested that those kinds of things, although you encode them implicitly, you probably aren't necessarily getting all of the information because it's not always important. So a lot of images are uh, implicitly encoded. It's unintentional storage of detail. And you only know that you have it or don't when you're asked to create the image. Many of you probably walk the same path from your apartment or your house uh, to campus. Uh, and you probably see a lot of the same things, uh, which means you're implicitly encoding that information, but you don't really have a good strong list, a semantic representation or a language-based list uh, for what those things are. Often this information is never accessed uh, until you need it at some later time. So principle number one, uh, visual imagery. Uh, visual images tend to be implicitly encoded not explicitly encoded. And that's one of the reasons why we just sometimes miss a lot of information. Number two, uh, there's a perceptual equivalence. In other words, whatever's true of the real object, uh, whatever principles are true of the real object, the amount of size it takes up, the amount of time it takes you to look from one side of an object to another side of the object, uh, there is some kind of perceptual equivalence in the image uh, that you've generated. The mental image preserves some of that perceptual characteristic, and it also preserves some of the spatial equivalence. The example I gave earlier, if it takes you a certain number of seconds to look from one side of the classroom the whole way to the other, it takes you time to turn your head, right? It takes you a certain amount of seconds uh, to move your eyes. Your eyes can't move instantaneously from the front to the back. It takes a few seconds, uh, half a second that mental image uh, is gonna preserve that spatial information. So that if you imagine, so take a look at the classroom, take a look at me, everything in front of you, uh, close your eyes and try to imagine scanning around, it's gonna take you a certain amount of time. You can't force yourself to instantaneously go from one corner of the classroom to the other corner of the classroom. And by the way, you can see this kind of thing uh, in auditory imagery as well. Auditory imagery is the idea of imagining a song or imagining a sound. If I ask you to start from the beginning of the you know, O Canada, of the uh, national anthem, uh, and ask you to think about which note uh, is higher for the beginning, O, or land, which is a higher note. It takes you a few seconds to get there, right? You have to sing it to yourself. How many of you can answer the question without singing it to yourself? Because you might actually just know the fact, right? Uh, but if you have to think about O, Canada, our home and native land. Oh, it is a little bit lower, but it's going to take you a little bit of time to get there. I didn't actually know the answer. Uh, it's going to take you a few seconds to get there because you have to play the song in your mind, right? Uh, if you're asked to alphabetize something, how many of you have to alphabetize something by singing the alphabet to yourself to determine which? And if you're not singing the alphabet to yourself, you're sometimes saying the alphabet to yourself. Uh, it takes time to get through the alphabet song, right? It takes a a few seconds to get through the alphabet song. Uh, so it takes longer to alphabetize things depending on where in that song they are. Most people can alphabetize things that are A, B, and C much faster and easier than they can alphabetize things later in the alphabet because it takes you time to sing through the alphabet. That's an auditory image that preserves the physical characteristics of the song, uh, even though it's a mental representation. So let's talk about some of the evidence, some of the psychological and neuropsychological evidence for uh, mental imagery. And some of these kinds of things are gonna also reflect back on those principles or properties that we just talked about. Yes. For audio memories like that, would we still have like a primacy and regency effect? Like the later letters yes. of the alphabet we recall easier than the stuff in the middle? Yeah, so for alphabet, for alphabetized things, uh, most people can alphabetize things that are begin with letters at the beginning and also begin with letters at the end. So there's a primacy recency effect for alphabetizing uh, in addition to this song-based effect uh, for alphabetizing. Absolutely. 
Uh, so three kinds of evidence I want to talk about. The first is uh, interference evidence. Uh, we've already talked briefly about some of this, but we'll revisit some of this again. Uh, the second, which is a, a stronger uh, area of research, is this manipulation evidence. So evidence that you can manipulate mental images in a way that's analogous to uh, how you would manipulate an object in real time. Uh, and then finally, uh, evidence that speaks to the pictorial properties of mental images. So going all the way back to 1970, uh, the year I was born, as a matter of fact, uh, Siegel and Fusella uh, were one of the first psychologists to start uh, thinking about uh, mental imagery and how it might be different from uh, direct perception and how it might be different from other kinds of uh, other kinds of psychological effects. So we can ask participants to form a visual or an auditory image. So asking you to form an image in this case is to imagine uh, seeing a point of light. That's not difficult to do, right? If you close your eyes and imagine a single point of light in the darkness, most of you could probably do this, right? Uh, I can also um, ask you to imagine, you can't really close your ears, but you can sort of get, you sort of know what I'm talking about. Imagine trying to not pay attention to the outside, trying to pay attention just to inner sounds, and try to imagine a tone in your mind. Can you do that? You can probably imagine a tone. You can probably imagine a point of light. So you can do both of these kinds of, most of you could probably do both of these kinds of imagery tasks, visual imagery and auditory imagery. And while you're imagining one of them, we're also gonna ask you to then do what's called a signal detection task. Uh, I'm gonna ask the subject to detect faint auditory signals or faint visual signals. And you've probably had to do things like this before if you've ever had your vision uh, tested or if you've ever had your hearing tested. Uh, that would be an example of a signal detection task where you're trying to detect faint auditory signals or faint visual signals. So participants are creating an image, they're imagining something, and they're also at the same time detecting something. You can kind of predict what's gonna come next. Uh, if you're imagining something visual, you're probably gonna have some difficulty detecting something visual as well, right? Uh, your performance in doing the actual detection is gonna be impaired and you're gonna create more false uh, recognition. Uh, in other words, you're gonna falsely see something when it isn't there because you're imagining something. And that would be evidence of this close correspondence between uh, visual or auditory imagery and actual direct perception. Essentially, that's what the researchers found. So. Uh, on the left, you see a plot that shows the percentage of detecting a signal. So that means correctly detecting a signal. While you're visualizing, uh, your performance is slightly reduced in detecting visual images, or sorry, visual stimuli. So if you're imagining something visual, and then you're asked to detect something visual, you're a little bit impaired when those two things interact, because they're using the same attentional pools. They're using the same resource pools. You're a little bit better at detecting an auditory signal when you're imagining something visual and vice versa. If you're imagining something auditory, you're a little bit better at detecting something visual. And you can see on the slide or the, uh, or the table on the right exactly why that is the case. It's because of the percentage of false alarms. You're more likely to falsely detect a visual signal when you're, de when you're imagining something visual. So what this is suggesting is that they rely on the same cognitive mechanisms and they probably rely on the same neural mechanism. If you're imagining something visual, you're using areas of the brain that are also going to be used in detecting something visual. So there's a direct correspondence, not only psychologically, but also at the neuropsychological level. Does that seem straightforward? So it's an interference effect. We actually saw this, I'll go through this briefly, because we talked about this when we talked about attention. Uh, so Brooks's experiment uh, essentially uh, was, was essentially an experiment in attention, but it was also an experiment that relied on visual imagery. Uh, so subjects either memorized a sentence uh, and then engaged in a form of auditory imagery by repeating the sentence back to themselves, uh, and then had to scan through the sentence and make a decision. 
uh, or they imagined a visual spatial stimulus. They imagined this large letter F and imagined uh, the asterisk tracing around it. And you had to say yes if the star is at the top or extreme top uh, or bottom. You probably remember this, so I'm not gonna go through it in great detail. Uh, and then we asked participants to respond uh, in one of three ways. One of them was a spatially demanding task that asked you to look uh, at a sheet of paper, find a yes or a no, and then point uh, at the yes or no, depending on whether or not the answer of what you were imagining was yes or no. Uh, the other was sort of a control condition, which was a tapping condition with left or right hands. Uh, and the other one was one that was verbally demanding. Uh, and just like the Siegel and Fusella example that we talked about, when you were imagining something visual spatial and your response perceptually is one that also used visual spatial cognitive mechanisms, we saw an impairment. Uh, and that's what we saw in Brooks's task uh, a few weeks ago. Um, when participants were thinking of sentences and they were asked uh, to uh, respond vocally, it took them longer than if they were pointing. And if they were thinking about uh, the visual image diagram, uh, it took them longer when they had to point, which is a visually spatially demanding task, than when they were uh, making a vocal response. Does that seem, is that good? All right, so that's the first course of evidence, is this uh, interference evidence. And the interference evidence suggests initially uh, that mental images, whether they're visual, uh, spatial, or acoustic, like a sentence, uh, rely on some of the same basic cognitive mechanisms and neuropsychological mechanisms that perception itself relies on. They're using some of those same processes. They're making demands for the same uh, cognitive process, and that's where the interference or impairment comes from. But more interesting research comes from some of Shepard's research and some of Stephen Coslin's research, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. Uh, Shepard and Coslin's research looked at how you can manipulate mental images uh, in the mind's eye. Yes. So, yeah, repeat what I just said about mental images rely. So the question is to repeat that. Uh, mental images rely on the same fundamental cognitive processes that direct perception does. So not only the same uh, aspects of cognition, uh, but also the same aspects of the neural architecture. So you're using areas of the brain that are designed to do uh, visual perception when you're engaging in visual imagery, even if there's nothing in front of you. So it's that direct correspondence at the neural level uh, that seems to account for these uh, interference effects. What Shepard and some other psychologists were interested in is what can we actually do with mental images? It's one thing to show that they use the same uh, neural systems. It's one thing to show that you're gonna have a competition for those uh, visual vision resources uh, when you're imagining something and when you're perceiving something, but what do you actually use an image for? Um, Shepard suggests that you use it to answer certain kinds of questions that might be answered best by manipulating an image uh, in your mind's eye. Uh, let's start with a really simple one. Uh, Shepard's uh, research was looking at whether or not participants could rotate a picture in their, in their mind's eye to be able to answer a question. The first question we'll answer, the, your, the asked subject's answer is really simple. You're going to be shown a letter, then the letter's going to disappear. Uh, and so you have to answer the question about the letter from your imagination of what you just saw. In other words, you see a letter on the screen, Letter disappears and you have to answer the question, is the letter facing forward or backward? So in other words, are you looking at text or are you looking at reversed text, right? So it's either yes or no, uh, forward, backward. That's a simple question because most of us can tell the difference between a letter that's facing forward or backwards, right? But it gets more difficult if the letter is also rotated a little bit uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the direct axis. So if a letter is upright, it's easy. If the letter is tilted to the right, it gets a little bit harder because you're not used to seeing those letters in that position. And what he found or what he suspected was that in order to answer the question, people would have to mentally rotate them in their mind's eye, not on the screen, but mentally rotate them. Uh, and that the longer you had to take to rotate it, in other words, the more you had to actually rotate it, the longer 
it would take you to answer the question. Just as if you were seeing a sheet of paper and you had to turn the sheet of paper, it takes just a split second to turn it if it's just a little bit off, but it takes you longer if you have to turn the, whole, the paper the whole way upside down. So you might see the letter K on the screen. Is this facing forwards or backwards? The letter disappears, it's forward, right? It's really easy to answer that one. Uh, is this one facing forwards or backwards? Backwards. How about this one? <laughs> forwards. How about this one? That takes a little bit longer because you have to, do you have to imagine rotating it or can you do it instantaneously? I mean, I, I know the answer to this because I made the slide, but I still imagine myself having to rotate it a little bit in order to answer the question. Uh, how about this one? Forwards, you got to imagine it going back. How about this one? Backwards, you got to imagine it rotating a little bit. Now, these are not huge effects. It's not as if you can't answer the question quickly. It just takes you a little bit longer. And remember, Shepard was also doing this not by directly looking at them, but by asking you to do it from memory. And what he found basically was the time to respond was a linear function uh, related to angular disparity. No matter how many times Shepard has done this experiment, no matter how many times anyone's done this experiment, it always takes longer to respond as a function of how much you would have to rotate the letter in real space. Nobody's actually rotating anything. What they're rotating is their mental image. And what Shepard's claim is that if the mental image was you know, just a description of something, if there was the, you know, if it was just a description of a letter, there's no particular reason why you have to rotate it in real time, right? You should be able to say, okay, that's a, an upside down art. Uh, but his suggestion is that people spontaneously seem to take longer to answer these questions when they're in this uh, more rotated position, almost as if they have no choice but to answer the question by imagining it rotating in, uh, in real time. So these mental rotation tasks, the process of continuously transforming the orientation of a mental image, uh, he explored this in greater detail uh, with other kinds of objects, uh, not just letters, but objects that are non-recognizable uh, objects. So it's one thing to do it with letters, uh, but imagine having to do it with other kinds of objects. Uh, so for example, in this uh, experiment, in the Shepard and Metzler experiment, um, you're looking at two objects and you're asked to say, are they the same or different? So on the top left, uh, the two green stimuli, are they the same or different blocks? They're the same, right? Uh, how about B, are they the same or different? I believe they are the same. Are they the same? Yes, they are the same. And the only way you can do it is to imagine, how many of you do it by taking the one on the right and imagining it rotating in depth? Probably the only way to do it, right? Uh, how about C, are they the same or different? C is different, right? Because if you imagine taking the one on the right and tilting it so that it, the bottom half goes back, then you find that it's not the same shape. It's a different shape. So in order to answer these, same or different, you need to look at them both and you need to imagine manipulating them. And remember, you can't actually do the twisting, but most of you probably have this feeling that you're trying to twist one in your mind's eye uh, and you're trying to imagine looking at it from a different angle. This struck Shepard and lots of others as really compelling evidence that we have a system, a visual imagery system that lets us answer questions like this that can only be answered uh, if we have the ability to do this real time mental manipulation of something that seems like perception. Uh, and so whether or not they were picture plane, and picture plane just means rotating it this way and depth means rotating it this way, it didn't seem to make any difference. Uh, the amount of angle that they had to rotate it was directly proportional to the response times in second. The more you had to rotate it, the longer it took you to answer the question, suggesting that the only way people answer these questions or the primary way in which people answer these questions uh, is to take these two things and imagine working with them in their mental space as if they were working with the blocks in real three-dimensional physical space. Does that seem clear? Yes. 
Yeah. Well, so that would be a great question. So the question is, why would something like this be on an IQ test? One possibility uh, is that it can assess uh, the span of your visual spatial working memory. Uh, the span of your visual working memory is something that would allow you to do a task like this. Now, of course, the downside is if you happen to be an individual with antiphasia, which is not related to IQ, which is someone who has uh, who lacks the ability to create visual images, you would not answer these questions uh, correctly uh, very often because you don't have an imagery system. I saw another hand up. Yes. It doesn't, yes, so that's a good question. The direction that you choose can differ. Uh, there's no particular reason why you would need to rotate it one direction or the other. Uh, the only thing that seems to be standard uh, is this relationship between how much you would need to rotate it uh, and how long it takes you to respond. Uh, so it, as far down as 180 degrees. Uh, in other words, uh, anything that's 15 degrees off of the vertical, uh, is easy for most people to get back, whether it's to the right or to the left. Uh, does that make sense? You wouldn't go all the way around. You could, uh, but most people would take the shortest route. Yes. So Shepard's work in conjunction with uh, the work prior to that, uh, with Brooks and Siegel, Siegel and Fusella's work, uh, suggests now two things about mental images. First of all, they seem to rely on some of the same basic cognitive and neural mechanisms, so much so that there's competition, almost as if you were trying to see two things simultaneously. If you're trying to see something and image something, uh, you still see some interference. Shepard's work suggests that people can rotate and manipulate mental images in a way that's analogous to real objects. Uh, Coslin went a little bit further and suggested that uh, people use images to answer all sorts of questions, and it seems as if they, even when the question could be answered without using an image, many people, most people, spontaneously seem to use these images uh, to answer questions. So a couple of different uh, suggestions here. Uh, Coslin's work suggests that mental images have picture-like properties. Uh, you can build these mental image, images, you can construct these visual images uh, in a way that suggests they have properties that are like real pictures or real objects. Um, and these are things like scanning across uh, an image in your mind's eye. That was the example we talked about uh, looking from one side uh, to the next uh, or imagining standing in front of your house on the street uh, and counting up uh, how many windows uh, are on your house. If you have a big house, it's going to take you longer than if you have a small house, because it's going to take you time uh, to scan across the front of the house. Uh, a zooming in task, a zooming in task, we'll see examples of each one of these on the next few slides. A zooming in task is a task in which, in order to answer the question, you need to look really closely at your image. In other words, sometimes large things and small things can be imagined simultaneously. But if you want to see detail on the small object, you need to zoom in as if you were sort of pinching to zoom in on a photograph. And that takes time, meaning that it's gonna take a little bit longer to answer questions about the smaller object. People can verify properties depending on how much space they take up on a mental image. And then finally, we'll talk about some neuropsychology research as well. Based on my um, estimation here, uh, which is not a mental image, but it is kind of a mental image, a prospective uh, mental image. We will likely complete today's lecture uh, around four o'clock. Uh, so again, we probably won't take a break today. Is that all right with everyone? Uh, so if I just keep on going and don't get distracted, uh, there's a good chance we'll be able to finish up uh, roughly 40 minutes earlier than what we normally would. So I'll just keep on going. But if you do need a break, just go right ahead. Of course, you know this lecture is recorded. You can just come back and uh, pick up where we left off, so no problems. Everybody all right with that? All right, good. Here's one of Coslin's most famous and most well-known tasks. Uh, this is where people have to imagine uh, a geographical feature. And we all do this kind of thing, by the way. I mean, we all do this kind of thing spontaneously. Uh, you probably have various types of navigational images 
uh, whether it's uh, for your hometown or a place where you're gonna visit, uh, or if you're imagining a map of Western's campus, you know how long it takes you to get from one place to the next, right? Uh, most of you could probably estimate the amount of time you would need to start walking from this building to get to, uh, let's say, Ivy. Uh, how long is it gonna take? How long does it take to get to the uh, Ivy building? 10 minutes? Would you give yourself like, only 10 minutes or would you try to give yourself 12 minutes? I'd give myself 12 minutes. Uh, if you had never been to Ivy, right? Uh, and you've never had the direct experience, how many of you can still feel pretty confident that you would be able to imagine how long it's gonna take you to get to anywhere on campus, even if you've never actually walked there? Would you feel pretty confident? I would. Uh, mostly because I know how long it takes me to walk halfway across campus, uh, and I have an image of where the buildings are. Uh, if it takes me 15 minutes to get to uh, the Ivy Building, I know it's going to take me another 15 minutes to get to the top of Brescia Hill, right? Uh, so maybe it's good. If I had to do something at Brescia's campus, it would take me about 20 minutes to get there. So I would give myself a half an hour, right? Most of us can reliably make those kinds of decisions, uh, and we use an image to help us do that. We have a mental image of the space. So Carlson was trying to investigate this more directly. He asked his participants to memorize a fictional ma uh, map of a fictional, is that the right word? Fictitious, Ficti fictional is not a word. Uh, I just made that, fi is fictional a word? Fic fictional, <laughs> what am I thinking? <laughs> I combined fictitious with fictional and I came up with fictitional, <laughs> which is actually a great word. Let's just say that's, I'm gonna just assume that's a real word. Let's just say fictitional is a word. I really like it. Um, so Coslin asked participants to imagine a fictitious island uh, and the island had lands, landmarks on it, right? Uh, so what's at the top? We've got some rocks. Uh, we've got a little prairie tall grass. We've got a, a little uh, building with a thatched roof. We've got a wishing well. We've got a beach. We've got a little co cove on the side. We've got a tree and a lake uh, and so on. So you memorize the map, including various landmarks, and then formed a mental image of the map. And you were asked questions to verify whether or not objects were on uh, this map. And what he found is that participants had to scan from one point of the mental image to another point and then press a button to indicate when in their mind's eye they had arrived at the destination. So imagine back, you didn't, you're not looking at it now, so we don't have the slide in front of you. Can you all sort of image that fictional island? How many of you can imagine the, the island, right? It, what was at the top? Rocks were at the top. Uh, and there was a wishing well on it, right? So imagine, close your eyes or leave your eyes open, but kind of unfocus them. Uh, and you're thinking of the rocks at the top, right? Now imagine going down to the wishing well. Like imagine scanning and then pressing the button. Now you're at the wishing well and imagine moving to the, uh, what was right next to the wishing well? The little thatched roof building, right? Uh, it only takes a few seconds to get there. It takes longer to get from the uh, rocks to the wishing well than it does to take to get from the wishing well to the thatched roof building. And what he found is that when people were asked to imagine the uh, island and then scan around the island or anything else, uh, the distance in actual centimeters from the picture that they had looked at and tried to memorize was a really good predictor of how long it would take them to respond. In other words, this is a strong correlation. Uh, if you did a regression on the using the actual distance to predict how long it would take people to uh, imagine getting there, it's a really good correspondence. People didn't measure it. They didn't take a, a measuring, uh, you know, a, a ruler or something and measure exactly how long it was. Uh, they just imagined the entire thing and then imagined themselves moving from one space to the next. And it was as if they had encoded that difference uh, automatically when they imagined the entire thing. Uh, so this suggests that we can scan across images in a way that is directly proportional to how long it takes you to scan across an actual photograph or an actual object. The zooming in tasks that also Stephen Coslin 
uh, ask participants to do, might ask them to imagine a large and a small object. Imagine two objects together at the same time, two animals. Uh, for example, an elephant on the right and the mouse on the left. The mouse is small relative to the elephant, right? The mouse is a much smaller animal. Uh, and then participants were asked to verify properties. They were asked to think about properties of some of the animals. Uh, and what he found is that it was faster for people to answer questions about the large animal. It didn't matter what the animal was or how familiar you were with the animal. If there was a large object and a small object and you were imagining, imagining them simultaneously, it always took participants a little longer to answer properties or to verify properties of the smaller objects, suggesting that you had to zoom in. Now, bear in mind, he's asking participants to use an image to answer the question. So they have to zoom in to answer the question for the smaller objects. Yes. So what did you suppose would happen if you could ask them to imagine an elephant-sized mouse or a mouse-sized elephant? So an elephant size. So if you ask to imagine an elephant-sized mouse or a mouse-sized elephant, they could be the same size. I would predict that the reaction time difference would would shrink. Uh, there would be a much smaller reaction time difference. Uh, actually, we're going to see an example like this. It's actually not answering that question, but there is an example later on in today's lecture where I do sort of have some images where things are really different in size in real life, but the images. Uh, our, uh, our equivalent. I mean, you can do that. You can imagine a gigantic mouse and a tiny elephant right next to each other, right? Uh, maybe it takes a little bit of difficulty. Uh, but in this case, the task was specifically to imagine a real size elephant and a real size mouse. And he found that it takes just a little bit longer to verify properties of the real sized mouse. More interestingly as well, if you're asked to answer questions or to verify properties based on the properties that are important, it can be done faster without an image. Uh, so imagine a cat versus think about the properties of a cat. Uh, so if I ask you to think about the properties or the features that are most relevant to a cat, what, what's the first feature that comes to mind when I ask you to think about a cat's? Whiskers, claws, maybe those kinds of things. Uh, that's what I think of. When I think of a cat and I think of the properties, not the image of a cat, but just the properties of a cat, the feature list or the things that are important that define what a cat is. The two things that come to mind for me are uh, whiskers, cat whiskers, and claws, uh, kitty's claws, right? Because they're usually really sharp. Those are two really important things uh, about cats. What I don't think of is a head, right? Because a head is not particularly important as a property uh, for a cat, because all animals have a head, right? So when people were asked to think about properties, they were faster to identify defining or highly associated things like claws. Uh, and that makes sense in that hierarchical representation that we talked about, right? If it's a feature that's closely connected, uh, it should be able to be retrieved quickly. But remember, things that are not closely connected, like head, for example, or skin, uh, which are not closely associated to cat, but are maybe part of the animal representation, should take you longer. But Coslin found the reverse when he asked him to think about an image. When you imagine a cat, so create a mental image, a picture in your mind's eye of a cat, and then ask to say, does the cat have a head? The head takes up more space uh, in the mental image. So if you're using the image to answer the question, uh, you're able to reverse that trend. Uh, claws, very small. You have to zoom in on the little paws there to see the claws on the cat, right? Uh, so if you're using a picture of the cat to answer the questions, the things that take up more space in the image are the more salient. Does that seem clear? Uh, so let's talk a little bit about where this breaks down. So there is some research that suggests that mental images are like perception but not exactly like perception. There are a couple of cases where we can show that uh, you can manipulate images in the mind's eye in a way that's slightly different from how you might imagine things perceptually, mostly because once you've created an image, you've also given it a name uh, and it becomes a symbol and it doesn't change the same way that maybe uh, a real object would. So it has some slightly different characteristics. Uh, real visual stimuli, in other words, real visual stimuli still have to be interpreted. When you see something in front of you, 
you have to put those features together and interpret what it is. But once you've imagined something, it's already interpreted. You've already uh, integrated the features. You've already put the features together uh, to create the image. Is it just me or does that door just always open on its own eventually? Like I close it and then I feel like nobody comes in and then like 20 minutes later, it's open. Please let me know if that's true. I just, in my, in my mind's eye, I think that door just opens up on its own. So if I see it open, uh, I have closed it. If it opens up and nobody comes in, very, very suspicious. Um, so images are already interpreted. And so one possibility or one suggestion is that they can't be reinterpreted if they're ambiguous. So let's look at two different ways in which you can change the characteristic of an object, of an image, and of a mental representation. Uh, so the, this first uh, suggestion is the influence of verbal labels on visual memory. This has to do with how you interpret the object initially if it's ambiguous. And once you've given it an interpretation, it changes the memory representation. Uh, so on the top, uh, in the middle, uh, shows the figure that participants were asked to remember. Uh, so they were given a figure that was uh, two blue circles with a line in between them. Uh, you can either recreate that by creating an image, or we can give you an, a label which changes the interpretation. And when you reimagine it, in order to draw it, uh, it changes how it looks. Uh, so if you get the original figure and you're told later, those were eyeglasses, like spectacles, right? And then you're asked to draw it, it's gonna be something where the circles are closer together, more like a pair of round eyeglasses. If the participants are told after they see the image that it was uh, a barbell, uh, then they are further apart, uh, more like uh, something that would be uh, a set of weights. Same thing with the ambiguous 7-4. You're told that it's a seven. Your representation later is reinterpreted uh, and changed uh, to be closer to that seven. Once it's given the label though, it's now a seven, right? It's a seven in your memory. It's a seven in your mind's eye. Same thing with the ship's wheel uh, and sun uh, characteristics. So we can see that if they're ambiguous pictures, they're ambiguous images, uh, once you've given a label to it and that becomes part of the representation, uh, it changes uh, the way in which you uh, store it. It changes the way in which you imagine it. Chambers and Riesberg uh, looked, at, uh, looked at this from a different perspective. Once you've imagined something that's ambiguous without a label, can you reinterpret that image uh, later on? Or is the image static? And what they found is that the image is static uh, in many cases, visual stimuli can be ambiguous. And you know what some of these look like, right? So the duck rabbit, uh, figure A, right? The one that can be simultaneously a duck uh, or a rabbit. And most of you have probably seen this figure before. Uh, and this is one that uh, most people can switch back and forth. Can you switch back and forth easily between the two images simultaneously so that it's, it's what's referred to as a bistable image. You can see both images. You can see duck when you focus uh, usually on the thing that's closer to the letter A. You can see bunny rabbit when you focus on the opposite side uh, so that it's either the duck bill uh, or the uh, ears of the rabbit, right? So we can switch back and forth. How many of you can switch back and forth between this easily? And the same thing with the cube uh, down there. Um, stimulus B, I think it's not supposed to be anything in particular. It's just asking people to switch things back and forth. Uh, C is the stairs going up versus stairs going down. So you can imagine these are really simple bistable images and most people can reverse them. If they're told that it's a rabbit and then they're told later, imagine it, can you think of anything else? Can you see it as a duck? People can see it as a duck, right? What Reesberg and Chambers found though is that if you didn't, if you saw these quickly uh, and then you were asked to create the image and you hadn't yet created the reversal, it was really difficult uh, to see both things simultaneously if you hadn't already made that distinction. So they asked people who had not yet, now most of us are familiar with the duck rabbit, 
they had participants who were not familiar with the duck rabbit. Uh, and you either see one or the other briefly. Uh, and so these are participants whose initial viewing suggested either duck or rabbit. One group of participants was asked, uh, so actually it was all one group of participants. These are all different experiments. Uh, let's look at the duck rabbit versions. Um, you see the object and then you can be asked one of two things. Uh, you can either be asked to draw what's in your mind's eye. So this is, I see duck rabbit, I just think it's a duck. I'm gonna now draw what I think I saw. And then you're asked, can you spontaneously reverse your own drawing? In other words, did you correctly draw something that is a bistable image? Now these drawings aren't great. I would argue that uh, the one on the left most is a pretty decent duck rabbit, but it's a little bit more duck-like. Um, the one on the center is definitely a duck. It's hard to imagine reversing that. The one on the top right, I could, that's not a bad duck rabbit there. You could imagine that even if you thought that was a duck, you could see how from one perspective, it could also be a rabbit. Does that make sense to everybody? So the drawings themselves aren't great, but you could sort of imagine being told, can you see the other one and still being able to reverse it? So what they found is that people could reverse drawings that they had created from an image, but if they were just imagining it in their mind, no participants, not a single participant across all four experiments was ever able to reverse an image. So what Riesberg was suggesting is that once you've created the image and in your mind, if you've categorized it and classified it as a duck, the image that you create is forever crystallized as duck uh, because you're using not, you're not using the uh, perceptual input from something in front of you that can be bistable, what you're using is a combination of the image with the label duck. Uh, and so it's become more duck-like uh, in your imagination. So what they found is that you can't reinterpret an image. The image is, in other words, a real representation. It's not uh, a real object, it's a representation of something that includes visual spatial information, but also includes uh, a label. Does that seem clear? So images are kind of like perception, but not exactly like perception. They can't be reinterpreted the way some perceptual things can be. Uh, generally speaking, we'll go through some uh, studies really quickly uh, that suggest that when people are uh, asked to imagine something or actually hear something, or when they're asked to uh, imagine something or actually see something, similar areas of the brain are activated. Uh, so this is an example of people who were asked to imagine a verbal jingle uh, or a spatial root. Uh, and what they found is that if people were asked to imagine themselves walking uh, in a particular spatial route, like walking from your house uh, to campus, uh, they activate areas of visual cortex. Uh, when you're asked to imagine uh, a commercial uh, song or a commercial jingle, you activate areas of auditory cortex. So the areas of the brain that are activated when you imagine yourself walking are the same areas that would actually be activated if you were directly walking. And we've seen aspects of this already. So this is uh, repeating some of the research we talked about at the very beginning uh, of the class. Uh, and this was that example of uh, Owen's research, Adrian Owen's research on uh, understanding consciousness in individuals who were experiencing uh, a severe type of coma uh, in which they seem to have no responsiveness. So a vegetative state. So individuals who didn't seem to have the ability to hear what was being said or to register any kind of conscious experience were still able to create visual images. Uh, if they were asked to imagine themselves uh, playing tennis, the area of the brain that was activated was the area of the brain that would be activated if they were playing tennis. So in other words, primary motor cortex. And that was true whether or not they were participants who were controls or participants who were uh, in a vegetative state. The area of the brain that was activated was motor cortex. Furthermore, they could use that uh, imagine yourself playing tennis as a proxy for a yes, no response. 
Uh, so you're able to spontaneously imagine tennis and it activates areas of the brain that correspond to uh, motor uh, cortex. Or you're able to imagine yourself navigating on your home street, uh, the street in your hometown. Uh, and you're able to imagine uh, that visual spatial uh, navigation uh, uh, area of the cortex. Uh, so this is something that people seem to be able to do spontaneously. I have uh, one last experiment that I want to talk to you about. This one takes just a little bit more to get through. Uh, and this is one of my favorite experiments to talk about because it's a really interesting, uh, well, for one thing, it's an interesting uh, idea. And it shows exactly how far down the information processing chain visual images can extend. And by information processing chain, I mean very close to the perceptual characteristics of vision. Uh, so what this study do, uh, did is it looked at eye tracking. Eye tracking is being able to measure exactly where you're looking uh, at an image, right? And most people probably have some basic familiarity with this. Uh, if you're tracking someone's uh, gaze, uh, you're using an infrared camera to bounce off the back of their retina so that you can see exactly what they're looking at. So you can show someone a screen, whether it's words or an image, uh, and you can look to see what areas of the screen uh, what areas of the picture they're actually looking at. Does that make sense? So eye tracking. So I'm gonna talk about two experiments uh, in this particular example. The first is a very simple object that people are asked uh, to see. Um, so baseline condition is just a blank screen and then you see a triangle. Uh, and when you see the triangle, you're asked to look uh, at aspects of the triangle. Uh, and what people spontaneously do, whether they're asked to or not, is they look at the corners of the triangle. I mean, that's exactly what you're doing right now, right? If I ask you to look at the triangle, you look at the triangle. And if you I measure your eye movements while you're looking at the triangle, they're gonna be triangle-shaped eye movements, right? Um, then we have a reset screen for 500 milliseconds. And then for five seconds, you see a blank screen. And I ask you to imagine a triangle. Imagine the same triangle. Just in your mind's eye, imagine where the triangle is. Where do you think your eye movements are gonna be? There's nothing there, but one possibility, if imagery is closely connected to the neural mechanisms of visual imagery or of visual perception, is that you will be moving your eyes in a way that corresponds to where that triangle was, but isn't anymore which not surprisingly is, I, wouldn't be, I would not be telling you about this study if that wasn't what they found. Uh, not surprisingly, that's what partici participants were doing. So these blue and red uh, dots on the plot show where people were looking when there was nothing there. They didn't have to look anywhere. They could have looked, uh, you know, given a 5,000 yard stare, they could have stared into space. They could have closed their eyes. Uh, they could have looked uh, at any different position, but most people, when asked to imagine, uh, looked at the space on the screen where the triangle was. Here's two different triangles. Uh, when they're looking at a triangle, when they're asked to imagine a triangle that's in an upright position, you can see that they're looking uh, at the space. On the left shows where they were actually looking. Uh, you can see that their gaze patterns are triangle shaped. That's them looking at a triangle. And you can see the red points. That's their gaze patterns when they're looking uh, at an upside down triangle. When they're asked to imagine the triangle, they look in pretty much the same space. So you can see which, uh, that they're looking at a triangle. They're imagining a triangle. There's nothing there to look at, but their eyes are moving as if they had seen a triangle. And you might not be too impressed with that because like what else are they gonna look at? Uh, it's the next study that's actually kind of impressive. Uh, so in the next study, they ask them to remember objects this is what I said about the uh, mouse-sized elephant. Look at the size of that wasp. Uh, that is an enormous wasp. That is an elephant-sized wasp. Now, granted, how many of you feel as if wasps are more threatening than elephants? Sometimes, usually around August, September, I feel as if they are about as threatening as elephants, right? Um, the bunny rabbit in the middle, not very threatening. The wasp, very threatening. 
So there, there's a reason they're all the same size, by the way. They're all the same size because we want to present them in the same visual space on the screen. So we're not actually asking people to imagine giant wasps and tiny uh, elephants and gigantic bunnies and tiny uh, camels. What we're asking people to do is to see a picture on the screen, and we're going to ask them to look at, this, at the object. Now, if I'm asking you to look at that wasp, where is your eye most naturally drawn? Where do you spend most time looking, do you think? I kind of spend most of my time on the face and on the uh, hideous abdomen uh, there that probably has a stinger, right? If I ask you to look at the uh, elk in the middle, where do you think you spend most of your time looking? I would spend most of my time looking at the antlers uh, because they're visually distinctive and they're kind of the area, they're the part of the object that seems to take up the most space. They're the part of the animal that's kind of the most characteristic. And with the elephant, maybe it would be the trunk. Uh, with the dolphin, you can sort of imagine areas of the dolphin that are important. With the camel, maybe it's the hump on the camel. Uh, so people looked at everything, but they spent a little bit more time looking at the interesting parts of the image and at the parts of the image that were the most salient psychologically or visually. So what they did uh, was they, for each image, now, because of, let me just go back a little bit here. It's easy for triangles, right? Because triangles have only three sides and three corners. So you can see on the right where the triangle is. But if we were gonna ask you to track your eye movements for those complex animals, the images are probably gonna be kind of indecipherable, right? Because they don't have a very uh, straight shape. For, furthermore, many of them have a head in the same position. So the, the gaze pattern for camel and the gaze pattern for a bunny might end up being kind of the same, even though the objects are different, we're looking at the head, right? So what they did was they divided the image up uh, into quadrants uh, and they categorized how much time do you spend looking at each quadrant? So there is our elk. Uh, the elk, uh, people spent in perception 77% of their visual time was spent looking at the animal's head and antlers. So fully three quarters uh, of the time that they spent looking at that image was in the upper right-hand quadrant. Only 1% of the time during uh, perception was spent looking uh, at the hind legs. So when you see a picture of an elk, you spend most of your time looking at the head and the antlers and very little time looking at the hind legs. Does that make sense? And what they also found was that most people, when they were asked to imagine in the same paradigm, so you see elk, then you see a, uh, a masking screen, and then you see a blank screen, and you're asked to just imagine the elk in your mind's eye, their eyes spend also 64% of their time in the area of the space where the elk's head was, but isn't anymore. And that's what the graph on the bottom is showing, uh, is the correspondence between perception and imagery uh, is a fairly strong uh, relationship. In other words, imagery and perception are closely connected, not only at the neural level, not only at the cognitive level, but even at this physiological level. Uh, your eye movements uh, respond as if they were looking at a real object, even though there's no real object to see anymore. All right, so I mentioned we might be finished around uh, four o'clock. We're finished even sooner than four o'clock. And I have no idea why I underestimated how long it was gonna take me to get through this, but apparently we're finished. Uh, this seems to be the final slide. So I apologize for shortchanging you on content today, uh, but it does appear to be a really nice afternoon. Uh, so that's like a free hour <laughs> uh, to do something enjoyable. Uh, this is just the uh, summary. Oh, it's a free hour to study material prior to the quiz, which is coming up uh, at five o'clock. So that's actually worked out really well. Um, so the summary for mental imagery, and there are a few imagery-based questions on the quiz, obviously. Uh, images preserve visual and spatial properties of the actual object. They can be manipulated and inspected like actual pictures. Uh, and most evidence from neuropsychology and also from physiology like eye tracking seems to support, support this contention as well. Before you go though, let me just remind everyone, obviously quiz is later today. 
we have a lecture on probability theory and Bayes, Bayesian reasoning on Wednesday uh, in person. Monday's lecture will be delivered online. I've already recorded the Monday lecture. Uh, so it will be available on Monday uh, just on the OWL site alone as a video. So we won't meet in person. I'll remind everyone one more time. I guess if you come here, there's no harm, but I won't be here. Uh, so we do have a class on Wednesday. We do have a class on Monday. It just will be only a virtual recording class for that day. All right, good luck on the quiz, everyone. <laughs>